Chapter 5 of True Stories of Crime from the District Attorney's Office by Arthur Cheney Train. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Franklin Syndicate. When Robert A. Amon, a member of the New York Bar, was convicted after a long trial on the 17th of June, 1903, of receiving stolen goods, he had in the parlance of his class, been due for a long time. The stolen property in question was the sum of $30,500 in greenbacks, part of the loot of the notorious Franklin Syndicate, devised and engineered by William F. Miller, who later became the cat's paw of his legal adviser, the subject of this history. Amon stood at the bar and listened complacently to his sentence of not less than four years at hard labor in Sing Sing. A sneer curved his lips as, after nodding curtly to his lawyer, he turned to be led away by the court attendant. The fortune snatched from his client had procured for him the most adroit of counsel, the most exhaustive of trials. He knew that nothing had been left undone to enable him to evade the consequences of his crime, and he was cynically content. For years, Bob Amon had been a familiar figure in the Wall Street District of New York. Although the legal adviser of swindlers and confidence men, he was a type of American whose energies, if turned in a less dubious direction, might well have brought him honorable distinction. Tall, strong as a bull, bluff, good-natured, reckless, and of iron nerve, he would have given good account of himself as an Indian fighter or frontiersman. His fine presence, his great vitality, his coarse humor, his confidence and bravado, had won for him many friends of a certain kind and engendered a feeling among the public that somehow, although the associate and adviser of criminals, he was outside the law, to the circumventing of which his energies were directed. Unfortunately, his experiences with the law had bred in him a contempt for it, which ultimately caused his downfall. "'The reporters are bothering you, are they?' he had said to Miller in his office. "'Hang them. Send them to me. I'll talk to them.' And talk to them he did." He could talk a police inspector or a city magistrate into a state of vacuous credulity, and needless to say, he was to his clients as a god knowing both good and evil, as well as how to eschew the one and avoid the other. Miller hated, loathed, and feared him, yet freely entrusted his liberty, and all he had risked his liberty to gain, to this strange and powerful personality which held him enthralled by the mere exercise of a physical superiority. The Franklin Syndicate had collapsed amid the astonished outcries of its thousands of victims on November 24, 1899, when, under the advice and with the assistance of Amon, its organizer, 520% Miller, had fled to Canada. It was nearly four years later, in June 1903, that Amon, arraigned at the Bar of Justice as a criminal, heard Assistant District Attorney Knott call William F. Miller convict to the stand to testify against him. A curious contrast they presented as they faced one another, the emaciated youth of twenty-five, the hand of death already tightly fastened upon his meager frame, coughing, hollow-cheeked, insignificant, flat-nosed, almost repulsive, who dragged himself to the witness chair, and the swaggering athlete who glared at him from the bar surrounded by his cordon of able counsel. As Amon fixed his penetrating gaze upon his former client, Miller turned pale and dropped his eyes. Then the prosecutor, realizing the danger of letting the old hypnotic power return, even for an instant, quickly stepped between them. Miller raised his eyes and smiled, and those who heard knew that this miserable creature had been through the fire and come forth to speak true things. The trial of Amon involved practically the reproving of the case against Miller, for which the latter had been convicted and sentenced to ten years in state's prison, whence he now issued like one from the tomb to point the skeleton incriminating finger at his betrayer. But the case began by the convict witness testifying that the whole business was a miserable fraud from start to finish, carried on and guided by the advice of the defendant. He told how he, a mere boy of twenty-one, burdened with a sick wife and baby, unfitted by training or ability for any sort of lucrative employment, a hanger-on of bucket shops, and, in his palmiest days, a speculator in tiny lots of feebly margined stocks, finding himself, without means of support, 
conceived the alluring idea of soliciting funds for investment promising enormous interest and paying this interest out of the principal entrusted to him for a time he preyed only upon his friends claiming inside information of large deals and paying ten per cent per week on the money received out of his latest deposits surely the history of civilization is a history of credulity miller prospered his earlier friend customers who had hesitatingly taken his receipt for ten dollars and thereafter had received one dollar every monday morning repeated the operation and returned in ever-increasing numbers from having his office in his hat he took an upper room in a small two-story house at one hundred and forty four floyd street brooklyn a humble tenement destined to be the scene of one of the most extraordinary exhibitions of man's cupidity and foolishness in modern times at first he had tramped round like a peddler delivering the dividends himself and soliciting more but soon he hired a boy this was in february eighteen ninety nine business increased the golden flood began to appear in an attenuated but constant rivulet he hired four more employees and the whole top floor of the house the golden rivulet became a steady stream from a panhandler he rolled in ready thousands the future opened into magnificent auriferous distances he began to call himself the franklin syndicate and to advertise that the way to wealth is as plain as the road to the market he copied the real brokers and scattered circulars and weekly letters over the country exciting the rural mind in distant manitoba and louisiana there was an instantaneous response his mail required the exclusive attention of several clerks the stream of gold became a rushing torrent every monday morning the floyd street house was crowded with depositors who drew their interest added to it deposited it again and went upon their way rejoicing nobody was going to have to work any more the out-of-town customers received checks for their interest drawn upon the franklin syndicate together with printed receipts for their deposits all signed william f miller by means of a rubber stamp no human hand could have signed them all without writer's cramp the rubber stamp was miller's official signature then with a mighty roar the torrent burst into a deluge the floyd street quarters were besieged by a clamoring multitude fighting to see which of them could give up his money first and there had to be a special delivery for Miller's mail. He rented the whole house and hired fifty clerks. You could deposit your money almost anywhere, from the parlor to the pantry, the clothes closet or the bathroom. Fridays the public stormed the house en masse since the money must be deposited on that day to draw interest for the following week. The crush was so enormous that the stoop broke down. Imagine it, in quiet Brooklyn, people struggling to get up the steps to cram their money into Miller's pockets. There he sat behind a desk at the top of the stoop, solemnly taking the money thrown down before him and handing out little pink and green stamped receipts in exchange. There was no place to put the money, so it was shoved onto the floor behind him. Friday afternoons, Miller and his clerks waded through it knee-high. There was no pretense of bookkeeping. Simply in self-defense, Miller issued in October a pronunciamento, that he could not, in justice to his business, consent to receive less than fifty dollars at one time. Theoretically, there was no reason why the thing should not have gone on practically forever, Miller and everybody else becoming richer and richer. So long as the golden stream swelled five times each year, everybody would be happy. How could anybody fail to be happy, who saw so much money lying around loose everywhere? But the business had increased to such an extent that Miller began to distrust his own capacity to handle it. He therefore secured a partner in the person of one Edward Schlesinger, and with him went to Charlestown, Massachusetts, for the purpose of opening another office, in charge of which they placed a man named Lewis Powers. History repeated itself. Powers shipped the deposit to Miller every day or two by express. Was there ever such a plethora of easy money? But Schlesinger was no Miller. He decided that he must have a third of the profits, heaven knows how they computed them, and have them moreover each day, in cash. Hence there was a daily accounting, part of the receipts being laid aside to pay off interest checks and interest, and the balance divided. Schlesinger carried his off in a bag. Miller took the rest, cash, money orders, and checks, and deposited it in a real bank. 
how the money poured in may be realized from the fact that the excess of receipts over disbursements for the month ending november sixteenth was four hundred and thirty thousand dollars hitherto miller had been the central figure colonel robert a amon now became the deus ex machina miller's advertising had become so extensive that he had been forced to retain a professional agent one rudolph gunther to supervise it and when the newspapers began to make unpleasant comments gunther took miller to amon's office in the bennett building in nassau street amon accepted a hundred dollars from miller listened to his account of the business and examined copies of the circulars when he was handed one of the printed receipts he said they were incriminating miller must try to get them back he advised as many other learned counselor has done incorporating the business since by this means stock could be sold and exchanged for the incriminating receipts he explained the mistakes of the dean crowd but showed how he had been able to safeguard them in spite of the fact that they had foolishly insisted on holding the stock in their company themselves instead of making their customers the stockholders nevertheless you do not see any of the dean people in jail boasted amon from now on miller and he were in frequent consultation and amon took steps to incorporate procuring for that purpose from wells fargo and company a certificate of deposit for one hundred thousand dollars occasionally he would visit floyd street to see how things were going miller became a mere puppet amon twitched the wire it was now well on in november and the press of both boston and new york was filled with scathing attacks upon the syndicate the reporters became so inquisitive as to be annoying to the peaceful miller send the reporters over to me directed amon the post of boston said the whole thing was a miserable swindle amon accompanied by miller carrying a satchel which contained fifty thousand dollars in greenbacks went to boston visited the offices of the post and pitched into the editor the business is all right you must give us a fair deal the pair also visited watts chief of police you keep your mouth shut said amon to miller i'll do all the talking he showed watts the bag of money and demanded what he had meant by calling the enterprise a green goods business if the thing wasn't all right did watts suppose that he colonel robert a amon would be connected with it the chief backed down and explained that he had jokingly referred to the color of one of the receipts which happened to be green in spite of amon's confidence however there was an uneasy feeling in the air and it was decided to put an advertisement in the post offering to allow any customer who so desired to withdraw his deposit without notice upon the following saturday this announcement did not have precisely the anticipated effect and saturday saw a large crowd of victims eager to withdraw their money from the boston office of the franklin syndicate powers paid the pauls of boston out of the bag brought on by miller containing the deposits of the peters of brooklyn meantime amon addressed the throng incidentally blackguarding a post reporter before the crowd telling them that his paper was a yellow paper had never amounted to anything and never would some timid souls took courage and redeposited their money the run continued one day and cost amon and miller about twenty eight thousand dollars amon took five thousand dollars cash as a fee out of the bag and the pair returned to new york but confidence had been temporarily restored the beginning of the end however was now in sight at least for the keen vision of bob amon he advised stimulating deposits and laying hands on all the money possible before the crash came accordingly miller sent a telegram collect to all depositors we have inside information of a big transaction to begin saturday or monday morning big profits remit at once so as to receive the profits william f miller franklin syndicate a thousand or so were returned the depositors having refused to pay the charges the rest of the customers in large measure responded but the game was nearly up there were scare heads in the papers miller saw detectives on every corner and like a rat leaving a sinking ship schlesinger scuttled away for the last time with a bag of money on the evening of tuesday november twenty first eighteen ninety nine the rest of the deposits were crammed into miller's desk and left there overnight the next morning miller returned to floyd street and spent that day in the usual routine and also on thursday remained until about twelve o'clock noon when he placed thirty thousand five hundred dollars in bills in a satchel and started for amon's office where he found schlesinger likewise with a satchel the jig's up announced schlesinger billy i think you'll have to make a run for it said amon the best thing for you is to go to canada
It still remained to secure the money, which Miller had deposited in the banks, in such a way that the customers could not get hold of it. Eamon explained how that could easily be done. The money should be all turned over to him, and none of the creditors would ever see it again. He did not deem it necessary to suggest that neither would Miller. Accordingly, the two, the lawyer and the client, went to the office of Wells Fargo and Company, Eamon obligingly carrying the satchel containing the $30,500. Here, Eamon deposited the contents to his own account, as well as the certificate of deposit for $100,000 previously mentioned, and a check for $10,000 representing the balance of Miller's loot. In addition to this, he received an order for $40,000 United States government bonds, which were on deposit with Wells Fargo and Company, and later, through Miller's father, $65,000 in bonds of the New York Central Railroad and the United States government. Thus, Eamon secured from his dupe the sum of $245,500, the actual market value of the securities bringing the amount up to $250,500, besides whatever sums he had been paid by Miller for legal services, which could not have been less than ten or fifteen thousand dollars. The character of the gentleman is well illustrated by the fact that later when paying Mrs. Miller her miserable pittance of five dollars a week, he explained to her that he was giving her that out of his own money and that her husband owed him. There still remained, however, the chance of getting a few dollars more and Eamon advised Miller to try to get Friday's receipts, which were the heaviest day's business. Acting on this suggestion, Miller returned to Floyd Street the next morning, at about half-past nine, finding a great crowd of people waiting outside. About one o'clock he started to go home, but discovering that he was being followed by a man whom he took to be a detective, he boarded a streetcar, dodged through a drugstore in a Chinese laundry, finally made the elevated railroad with his pursuer at his heels, and eventually reached the lawyer's office about two o'clock in the afternoon. Word was received almost immediately over the telephone that Miller had been indicted in Kings County for conspiracy to defraud, and Eamon stated that the one thing for Miller to do was to go away. Miller replied that he did not want to go unless he could take his wife and baby with him, but Eamon assured him that he would send them to Canada later in charge of his own wife. Under this promise, Miller agreed to go and Eamon procured a man named Enright to take Miller to Canada, saying that he was an ex-detective and could get him out of the way. Eamon further promised to forward to Miller whatever money he might need to retain lawyers for him in Montreal. Thereupon Miller exchanged hats with someone in Eamon's office and started for Canada in the custody of the lawyer's representative. How the wily colonel must have chuckled as poor Miller trotted down the stairs like a sheep leaving his fleece behind him. A golden fleece, indeed. Did ever a lawyer have such a piece of luck? Here was a little fellow who had invented a brilliant scheme to get away with other people's money and had carried it through successfully, more than successfully, beyond the dreams of even the most avaricious criminal. And then, richer than Midas, had handed over the whole jolly fortune to another, for the other's asking without even taking a scrap of paper to show for it. More than that, he had then voluntarily extinguished himself. Had Eamon not chuckled, he would not have been Bob Eamon. The money was stolen, to be sure, but Eamon's skirts were clear. There was nothing to show that the $245,000 he had received was stolen money. There was only one man, a discredited felon, who could hint that the money was even tainted, and he was safely over the border in a foreign jurisdiction, not in the custody of the police, but of Eamon himself, to be kept there, as Mr. Robert C. Taylor so aptly phrased it in arguing Eamon's case on appeal, on waiting orders. Eamon had Miller on a string, and as soon as Eamon, for his own sake, was compelled to either produce Miller or run the risk of indictment, he pulled the string and brought Miller back into the jurisdiction. Needless to say, great was the ado made over the disappearance of the promoter of the Franklin Syndicate, and the authorities of Kings County speedily let it become known that justice required that someone should be punished for the colossal fraud which had been perpetrated. The grand jury of the county started a general investigation. Public indignation was stirred to the point of ebullition. In the midst of the rumpus, there came a knock on the office door of the Honorable John F. Clark, District Attorney of Kings County, and Colonel Robert A. Amon announced himself. The two men were entire strangers to each other, but this did not prevent Amon, with his inimitable assurance from addressing the District Attorney by his first name. How are you, John? he inquired nonchalantly. What can I do for you? 
Mr. Clark repressed his natural inclination to kick the insolent fellow forcibly out of his office, invited him to be seated, and rang for a stenographer. Eamon asserted his anxiety to assist the district attorney by every means in his power, but denied knowing the whereabouts of Miller, alleging that he was simply acting as his counsel. Mr. Clark replied that in Miller's absence, the grand jury might take the view that Eamon himself was the principal. At this, Eamon calmly assured his host that as far as he was concerned, he was ready to go before the grand jury at any time. "'That is just what I want,' returned Mr. Clark. "'The grand jury is in session. Come over.' Eamon arose with a smile and accompanied the district attorney towards the door of the grand jury room. Just outside, he suddenly placed his hand to his head as if recollecting something. "'One moment,' he exclaimed. "'I forgot that I have an engagement. I will come over tomorrow.' "'Ah!' retorted Mr. Clark. "'I do not think you will be here tomorrow.' Two weeks later, Miller was safely ensconced without bail in Raymond Street Jail. Schlesinger, who got away with $175,000 in cash, fled to Europe where he lived high, frequenting the racetracks and gaming tables until he was called to his final account a year or two ago. The money which he took has never been traced. Miller was tried, convicted, and sent to Sing Sing. The appellate division of the Supreme Court then reversed his conviction, but later, on appeal to the Court of Appeals, it was sustained. Of the enormous sums turned over to Eamon, Miller received nothing, save the money necessary for his support in Montreal, for the lawyers who defended him, and five dollars per week for his wife and child up to the time he turned state's evidence. It is interesting to note that among the counsel representing Miller upon his trial was Eamon himself. Miller's wife and child were not sent to Montreal by Eamon, nor did the latter secure bail for his client at any time during his different periods of incarceration. The colonel knew very well that it was a choice between himself and Miller, and took no steps which might necessitate the election falling upon himself. The conviction of Miller with his sentence to ten years in state's prison, did not, however, prevent the indictment of Eamon for receiving stolen money in New York County, although the chance he would ever have to suffer for his crime seemed small indeed. The reader must bear in mind that up to the time of Eamon's trial, Miller had never admitted his guilt, that he was still absolutely and apparently irrevocably under Eamon's sinister influence, keeping in constant communication with him and implicitly obeying his instructions while in prison and that Miller's wife and child were dependent upon Eamon for their daily bread. No wonder Eamon strode the streets confident that his creature would never betray him. Now, Billy, you don't want to be shooting off your mouth up here, was his parting injunction to his dupe on his final visit to Sing Sing, before he became a guest there himself at the expense of the people. Miller followed his orders to the letter, and the stipend was increased to the munificent sum of $40 per month. Meantime, the case against Eamon languished, and the district attorney of New York County was at his wit's ends to devise a means to procure the evidence to convict him. To do this, it would be necessary to establish affirmatively that the $30,500 received by Eamon from Miller and deposited with Wells Fargo and Company was the identical money stolen by Miller from the victims of the Franklin Syndicate. It was easy enough to prove that Miller stole hundreds of thousands of dollars, that Eamon received hundreds of thousands, but you had to prove that the same money stolen by Miller passed to the hands of Eamon. Only one man in the world, as Eamon had foreseen, could supply this last necessary link in the chain of evidence, and he was a convict and mute. It now became the task of the district attorney to induce Miller to confess the truth and take the stand against Eamon. He had been in prison a considerable time, and his health was such as to necessitate his being transferred to the hospital ward. Several of the district attorney's assistants visited him at various times at Sing Sing in the hope of being able to persuade him to turn state's evidence. But all their efforts were in vain. Miller refused absolutely to say anything that would tend to implicate Eamon. At last, the district attorney himself, accompanied by Mr. Knott, who later prosecuted Eamon, made a special trip to Sing Sing to see what could be done. They found Miller lying upon his prison pallet, his harsh cough and blazing eyes speaking only too patently of his condition. At first, Mr. Knott tried to engage him in conversation, while the district attorney occupied himself with other business in another part of the ward, but it was easily apparent that Miller would say nothing. The district attorney then approached the bed where Miller was lying and inquired if it were true that he declined to say anything which might tend to incriminate Eamon. 
After some hesitation, Miller replied that, even if he should testify against his old accomplice, there was nothing to show that he would be pardoned, and that he would not talk unless he had actually in his hands some paper or writing which would guarantee that if he did so he would be set free. The spectacle of a convicted felon haggling with an officer of the law over the terms upon which he would consent to avail himself of an opportunity to make the only reparation still possible angered the district attorney, and turning fiercely upon the prisoner, he arraigned him in scathing terms, stating that he was a miserable swindler and thief who had robbed thousands of poor people of all the money they had in the world, that he showed himself devoid of every spark of decency or repentance by refusing to assist the law in punishing his confederate and assisting his victims in getting back what was left of the money, and that he, the district attorney, felt himself humiliated in having consented to come there to visit and talk with such a heartless and depraved specimen of humanity. The district attorney then turned his back upon Miller, whose eyes filled with tears, but who made no response. A few moments later, the convict asked permission to speak to the district attorney alone. With some reluctance, the latter granted the request, and the others drew away. Mr. District Attorney, said the wretched man in a trembling voice, with the tears still suffusing his eyes, I am a thief. I did rob all those poor people, and I am heartily sorry for it. I would gladly die, if by doing so I could pay them back but I haven't a single cent of all the money that I stole, and the only thing that stands between my wife and baby and starvation is my keeping silence. If I did what you ask, the only money they have to live on would be stopped. I can't see them starve, glad as I would be to do what I can now to make up for the wrong I have done. The district attorney's own eyes were not entirely dry as he held out his hand to Miller. Miller, he replied, I've done you a great injustice. I honor you for the position you have taken. Were I in your place, I should probably act exactly as you are doing. I cannot promise you a pardon if you testify against Eamon. I cannot even promise that your wife will receive forty dollars a month, for the money in my charge cannot be used for such a purpose. All I can assure you of is that, should you decide to help me, a full and fair statement of all you may have done will be sent to the governor with a request that he act favorably upon any application for a pardon which you may make. The choice must be your own. Whatever you decide to do, you have my respect and sympathy. Think well over the matter. Do not decide at once. Wait for a day or two, and I will return to New York, and you can send me word. The next day, Miller sent word that he had determined to tell the truth and take the stand, whatever the consequences to himself and his family might be. He was immediately transferred to the Tombs Prison in New York City, where he made a complete and full confession, not only assisting in every way in securing evidence for the prosecution of Amon, but aiding his trustee in bankruptcy to determine the whereabouts of some $60,000 of the stolen money, which, but for him, would never have been recovered. At the same time, Eamon was rearrested upon a bench warrant, and his bail sufficiently increased to render his appearance for trial probable. As Miller had foreseen, the monthly payment to his wife instantly stopped. The usual effect produced upon a jury by the testimony of a convict accomplice is one of distrust or open incredulity. Every word of Miller's story, however, carried with it the impression of absolute truth. As he proceeded, in spite of the sneers of the defense, an extraordinary wave of sympathy for the man swept over the courtroom, and the jury listened with close attention to his graphic account of the rise and fall of the outrageous conspiracy, which had attempted to shield its alluring offer of instant wealth behind the name of America's most practical philosopher, whose only receipt for the same end had been frugality and industry. Supported as Miller was by the corroborative testimony of other witnesses and by the certificates of deposit, which Eamon had, with his customary bravado, made out in his own handwriting, no room was left for even the slightest doubt, not only that the money had been stolen, but that Eamon had received it. Indeed, so plain was the proposition that the defense never for an instant contemplated the possibility of putting Eamon upon the stand in his own behalf. It was in truth an extraordinary case, for the principal element in the proof was made out by the evidence of the thief himself that he was a thief. Miller had been tried and convicted of the very larceny to which he now testified, and although in the eyes of the law no principle of res adjudicata could apply in Eamon's case, it was a logical conclusion that if the evidence upon the first trial was repeated, 
the necessary element of larceny would be effectually established. Hence, in point of fact, Miller's testimony upon the question of whether the money had been stolen was entirely unnecessary, and the efforts of the defense were directed simply to making out Miller such a miscreant upon his own testimony that perforce the jury could not accept his evidence when it reached the point of implicating Amon. All their attempts in this direction, however, only roused increased sympathy for the witness and hostility toward their own client, and made the jury the more ready to believe that Amon had been the only one in the end to profit by the transaction. Briefly, the two points urged by the defense were, one, that Amon was acting only as Miller's counsel, and hence was immune, and two, that there was no adequate legal evidence that the $30,500 which Amon had deposited, as shown by the deposit slip, was the identical money stolen from the victims of the Franklin Syndicate. As bearing upon this, they urged that the stolen money had in fact been deposited by Miller himself, and so had lost the character of stolen money before it was turned over to the defendant, and that Miller's story being that of an accomplice required absolute corroboration in every detail. The point that Amon was acting only as a lawyer was quickly disposed of by Judge Newberger. Something has been said by counsel, he remarked in his charge to the jury, to the effect that the defendant as a lawyer had a perfect right to advise Miller, but I know of no rule of law that will permit counsel to advise how a crime can be committed. As to the identity of the money, the court charged that it made no difference which person performed the physical act of placing the cash in the hands of the receiving teller of the bank, so long as it was deposited to Amon's credit. On the question of what corroboration of Miller's story was necessary, Judge Ingram, in the appellate division, expressed great doubt as to whether in the eyes of the law, Miller, the thief, could be regarded as an accomplice of Amon in receiving the stolen money at all, and stated that even if he could be so regarded, there was more than abundant corroboration of his testimony. Amon's conviction was affirmed throughout the courts, including the Court of Appeals, and the defendant himself is now engaged in serving out his necessarily inadequate sentence. Necessarily inadequate, since under the laws of the State of New York, the receiver of stolen goods, however great his moral obliquity may be, and however great the amount stolen, can only receive half the punishment which may be meted out to the thief himself, receiving being punishable by only five years or less in state's prison, while grand larceny is punishable by ten years. Yet, who is the greater criminal, the weak, ignorant, poverty-stricken clerk, or the shrewd, experienced lawyer who preyed upon his client and through him upon the community at large? The confession of Miller, in the face of what the consequences of his course might mean to his wife and child, was an act of moral courage. The price he had to pay is known to himself alone, but the horrors of life in prison for the squealer were thoroughly familiar to him when he elected to do what he could to atone for his crime. In fact, Amon had not neglected to picture them vividly to him, and to stigmatize an erstwhile client of his. Everything looks good, he wrote to Miller in Sing Sing, in reporting the affirmance of Goslin's conviction, especially since the squealer is getting his just deserts. With no certain knowledge of future pardon, Miller went back to prison cheerfully to face all the nameless tortures inflicted upon those who helped the state. The absolute black silence of convict excommunication, the blows and kicks inflicted without opportunity for retaliation or complaint, the hostility of guards and keepers, the suffering of abject poverty, keener in a prison house than on any other foot of earth. It is interesting to observe that Miller's original purpose had been to secure money to speculate with, for he had been bitten deep by the tarantula of Wall Street, and his early experiences had led him to believe that he could beat the market, if only he had sufficient margin. This margin he set out to secure. Then, when he saw how easy it was to get money for the asking, he dropped the idea of speculation and simply became a banker. He did make one bona fide attempt, but the stock went down, he sold out, and netted a small loss. Had Miller actually continued to speculate, it is doubtful whether he could have been convicted for any crime, since it was for that purpose that the money was entrusted to him. He might have lost it all in the street and gone scot-free. As it was, in failing to gamble with it, he became guilty of embezzlement. Amon arrived in Sing Sing with a degree of eclat. He found numerous old friends and clients among the inmates. He brought a social position which had its value. 
Money, too, is no less desirable there than elsewhere, and Eamon had plenty of it. In due course, but not until he had served more than half his sentence, less commutation, Miller, a broken man, received his pardon and went back to his wife and child. When Governor Higgins performed this act of executive clemency, many honest folk in Brooklyn and elsewhere loudly expressed their indignation. District Attorney Jerome did not escape their blame. Was this contemptible thief, the meanest of all mean swindlers, who had stolen hundreds of thousands, to be turned loose on the community before he had served half his sentence? It was an outrage, a disgrace to civilization. Reader, how say you? End of chapter 5. Recording by Colleen McMahon.